For years, lasers have been a hallmark of science fiction. Though much of our modern technology depends on them, even throughout our daily lives. Some noteworthy examples include range-finding devices, optical communications, and of course, even barcode scanners. The unique properties of laser light that makes this possible are single wavelength, narrow beam, and great intensity. Additionally, laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. The unique characteristics of lasers even allow surgeons to reattach retinas, further underscoring their value to modern medicine. An injury can cause the eye's retina to peel away from the supporting tissue. And without rapid treatment, the entire retina can become detached, resulting in blindness. Surgeons can use green laser light from an eczema laser of nearly a single wavelength since that color passes through the eye's lens and vitreous humor and is not strongly absorbed, avoiding further damage. The laser beam then strikes the retina where the tissue greatly absorbs the light. At this point, the high-intensity light welds the detached retina back into place. The narrowness of the laser beam enables the surgeon to affect only the area of the retina that needs to be repaired, in areas as small as 30 microns. How a laser creates light with these three characteristics is a marvel of engineering. In 1960, the first demonstrated use of the functional laser was credited to Theodore Maiman at Hughes Research Laboratories, in which he took a ruby cylinder and surrounded it with a xenon arc flash lamp, typically used in aerial photography. Maiman's ruby laser, as it was known, was based on theoretical work by Charles Hart Towns and Arthur Leonard Shallow. The intense burst of light from the lamp initiated the laser process. To better understand how it works, let's look at what happens when applying light from a weaker lamp. A flash would promote a few electrons from the ground state to an excited state. Subsequently, they would lose a bit of energy, fall to a lower energy state without emitting light, and then drop from there to the ground state, giving off a burst of light. Thereafter, the light produced would be called incoherent light, which is a spectrum of colors and intensities. However, in order to create a laser, a much more powerful lamp is necessary. In the ruby laser, repeated flashes called pumping creates an amazing phenomenon. So much energy is applied that a population inversion occurs. Population inversion is essentially when more atoms exist in the higher excited state than the lower unexcited or ground state. Electrons from a population inversion that are returning to the ground state release light that starts an avalanche called stimulated emission. We'll go into more detail on stimulated emission later in this video. The photon produced when an electron decays induces other excited electrons to simultaneously decay and release nearly identical photons. Thereafter, coherent light is created, which means that the crests and troughs of every light wave in the beam match up. At this point, we have coherent light, but not yet the other two properties needed for laser light. To get a narrow beam with all the light rays parallel and a nearly single wavelength requires an addition to our ruby laser example. To achieve this, Maiman incorporated silvered ends to reflect the light within the ruby cylinder, creating a resonance cavity. He made the two ends of the rod parallel to each other. From top to bottom, the distance between these two mirrors differs by no more than 200 nanometers. Two important things take place inside the resonance cavity. First, any light rays that fail to line up within the axis eventually exit out from the side of the cylinder. And more importantly, the light parallel to the axis becomes intensified and narrowed in wavelength. At this point, we now meet the three characteristics of a laser. The way it works is that mirrored ends create a standing wave. This means that only light at a particular wavelength can exist inside the cavity. By selecting the correct rod length, we're able to get the nearly single wavelength of light, characteristic of a laser. The addition of a small opening in one of the mirrors allows the light to escape, creating the quintessential laser beam. In technical terms, what allows the light to escape is that the mirrors are highly reflective and only the light that meets the resonance condition will be transmitted out of the pinhole aperture. Now that we have a better understanding of the fundamentals of how a laser works, let's take a look at the two main flavors of a laser. 
Generally, the operation of a laser can either be continuous wave or pulsed. The primary determinant rests on whether the power output is essentially continuous over time, or whether its output takes the form of pulses of light on some variation of a time scale. In fiber optic communication, information is transmitted through optical fiber by virtue of sending pulses of infrared light. Essentially, an electromagnetic carrier wave is formed by the light pulses that are modulated and such to carry information. Fiber supersedes electrical cables which fall short when high bandwidth, long distance is required for data transmission. Additionally, fiber is immune to electromagnetic interference, which makes it ideal to transmit voice, video, and telemetry through local area networks and computer networks across long distances. But in order to transmit data, fiber optic communication systems generally utilize an optical transmitter to convert an electrical signal into an optical signal which is then sent through the optical fiber. The optical fiber is composed of bundles of multiple optical fibers that are routed through underground conduits and buildings. Typically, such a network would include multiple amplifiers and an optical receiver to recover the signal as an electrical signal. Most commonly, the optical transmitters used in these systems are semiconductor devices, such as light emitting diodes or LEDs and laser diodes. The underscoring difference between LEDs and laser diodes is that the LEDs produce incoherent light, while laser diodes produce coherent light. For our purposes, we will focus our attention on laser diodes. A semiconductor laser emits light through stimulated emission rather than spontaneous emission. In the following model, there will be some repeated information from the Ruby laser example we previously mentioned, for the sake of providing a better understanding. With stimulated emission, an atom at a low energy level can be stimulated, which means it can be hit with a photon and subsequently take the energy of the photon and move to a higher energy level. This process is known as stimulated absorption and refers to the absorption of the photon. Now, if the atom falls back down again, it would give off the exact same photon. This is known as spontaneous emission because it happens spontaneously. Since the probability of moving to a higher energy level without a photon is incredibly small and moving back down to a low energy level is high, an atom that has already been stimulated and is already at a high energy level is stimulated once again. The effect is, a singular photon comes in and in stimulated emissions, two photons come out. With a number of different atoms added to our example, stimulated emission creates a compounding effect with each atom giving off two additional photons that are coherent to each other. The result is high output power and the other benefits associated with the inherent nature of coherent light. The output of a laser is relatively directional which offers high coupling efficiency within a single mode fiber. Since the spectral width is narrow, it also provides for high bit rates since chromatic dispersion is significantly reduced. Chromatic dispersion is the result of the different colors or wavelengths in a light beam arriving at their destination at slightly different times. Let's now shift our focus on how lasers are being used in other industries. Laser cleaning is a process of removing contaminants such as rust, oil, and oxides on steel, and in some cases, other surfaces using laser technology. It is achieved through laser ablation, which is a process through which a pulse laser deposits a certain amount of energy on a surface and removes the material by evaporation or sublimation. Essentially, the molecular bonds in the dust or rust layer are broken and ejected from the substrate. In less technical terms, you can imagine that the layer to be removed is simply vaporized by the focused laser beam. The two types of laser cleaning methods can either be a continuous stream of light or pulsed at a given duty cycle. Generally, the end result is much the same. However, the speed of the process is considerably different depending on the methodology chosen. For a given surface area, putting the same energy in a much shorter pulse increases the power. The pulse laser methodology is more efficient and provides a faster removal speed than the continuous beam. While the pulse laser beam does the cleaning faster, it also ensures that the underlying material, typically a metal, does not heat up too much. 
Compared to industrial cleaning techniques, laser cleaning only uses a laser beam to vaporize the layer to be removed. Thus, there are no consumables such as solvents or chemical products used within this technology. Looking forward, laser technology continues to be further researched for the versatility of its application. More recently, it has been the focus of discussion for its potential use as a direct energy weapon on satellites to protect the Earth from extraterrestrial bodies such as asteroids. And in one instance, a private Japanese company is proposing the development of a satellite that can shoot down space junk ranging from old abandoned satellites to rocket parts still orbiting the Earth to this day.